And excellent. Our chair, David Bagensberg, is not going to be here with us today. And so Oscar Arana, vice chair, is going to be leading us through our meeting today. So welcome, Oscar, and all the members, and Happy New Year. Good morning. Thank you, Tara. Um, are we ready to go? Yep, we're ready to go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. As you already heard, uh, Chair Banksberg was not able to join us today, so I'm stepping in. Uh, and my name is Oscar Arana. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the vice chair of the Oregon Health Policy Board. Uh, the Zoom chat feature in today's meeting only allows meeting attendees to message the host and the co-host and no other meeting participants. Um, any questions, thoughts, or comments can be sent uh, via Zoom uh, chat to the meeting host or co-host, or you can also email the Oregon Health Policy Board at uh, healthpolicyboard.info at DHS oha.state.or.us. Um, also, today's meeting materials are available on the Oregon Health Policy Board website and hyperlinked uh, in the meeting material columns of today's agenda. All right, uh, let's start with a roll call. Tara, will you help us out? Absolutely. So like I said, we will not have David Banksberg with us today. Um, Oscar Arana. Here. Ebony Clark. Okay, we'll come back to Ebony. Jessica Gomez. Here. Kirsten Isaacson. Here, good morning. All right, just a reminder, if you could please mute yourself, that would be excellent, thank you. Brenda Johnson. Here, good morning. Good morning. Bill Kramer? Here. John Santa? Here. All right, and I wanted to loop back to see if Ebony was able to join us. I don't hear Ebony. I'll connect with her offline. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, Tara. Um, and happy 2022. Um, I hope everyone had a uh, restful and stress-free holiday season. Um, I would like to thank everyone for your dedicated <laughs> service and commitment to the Oregon Health Policy Board uh, last year. We accomplished a lot working together uh, from implementation of the cost growth target program to working on OHA's 1115 Medicaid waiver renewal application. Um, reviewing new approaches to OHPB committee membership and so much more. Uh, always with a central focus on health equity uh, and also during a nearly two year pandemic. Uh, I am grateful for all of your contributions. I hope you are proud of our progress together. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with you all and have another successful year. Um, I'd like to open up just the space for any of the board members uh, to offer either any reflections of our last year or uh, any um, areas of, of work that they're particularly excited about in 2022. Oscar? Yes. Yeah, this is John Santa. I, I just um, mentioned that I think the uh, Task Force on Universal Healthcare also has a very interesting agenda in 2022. And um, I hope that um, uh, the board um, uh, hears more about uh, that activity, which I'm involved in. Great, thank you, John. Any, uh, anyone else? All right. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited to uh, continue working together this year, and I know we'll have a lot more success. Um, just a really quick update. We've already shared this info with uh, board members, but for staff, 
partners and community members who are not aware, we are going to postpone uh, the OHPB annual retreat originally scheduled for next month. Uh, with the Omicron wave upon us, OHA is now preparing for an all hands on deck response and is rescheduling or delaying work that is not immediately urgent. Uh, while the OHPB chairs and OHA leadership agree that our upcoming February retreat is important for annual planning and collaboration, we would like to wait and hold a retreat until after the surge ends so committees and staff can be fully engaged and present. Uh, we did not want to add additional stress to our partners and community members uh, and we will hear more about OHA's efforts and the current variants and surge in Director Allen's update in just a few uh, moments. All right, and um, also due to staff priority issues regarding COVID and the legislative de deadlines, uh, we had to make a couple of changes in today's agenda, uh, which means we may end a little bit early. Uh, in today's meeting, we will cover Oregon Health Authority updates on COVID re recovery and response efforts, uh, an overview of Oregon, Oregon's health reform roadmap and the many bodies of work that complement each other to provide equitable quality health to Oregonians, an update from the cost growth target program on their initial public hearing planning efforts and ongoing membership recruitment work, uh, we'll hear public comments on all topics, but hold specific comments on the 1115 waiver until later in the meeting. Uh, we'll take a break and then we'll hear from OHA's uh, 1115 waiver team on how public comment is coming along. And we'll end today's meeting with uh, public comments on OHA's 1115 waiver renewal. And uh, our first order of business this year is uh, to vote on the draft December meeting minutes. Uh, a copy of the minutes is included in your board materials, attachment number one, and it's posted in today's agenda and on the Oregon Health Policy Board's website. Uh, can I get a motion to approve December meeting minutes? So moved. Second, this is Brenda, thanks. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, those uh, December meeting minutes are approved. Um, let's go ahead. I'd like to welcome Director Allen. Uh, Director Allen, thank you for joining us today. We're ready for your update. Great, thanks, Vice Chair, Honor members. A um, few things uh, around COVID to update you on. Um, as uh, uh, Vice Chair Rana observed, we're uh, definitely into the Omicron wave. Um, uh, we don't have sequencing data yet to fully document how uh, what percentage of cases are Omicron cases, uh, because there's a, a fairly significant lag in that data as sequencing gets gets done, but the case number behavior certainly uh, looks uh, much more like Omicron than Delta that we probably have uh, that we probably have both today. We're going to be reporting 4,540 cases, uh, which is far and away the largest number of cases we've uh, we've ever reported. Tuesdays, though, is the day where uh, counties that didn't report over the weekend. Um, uh, where, where their reports show up. They report on Monday and that data through midnight is what we released today. So that's a bit of an overcount for a single day, uh, for a single day number, but still a, a, a pretty a pretty dramatic number. The case positivity uh, reported for today is over 18%. Uh, that's also, I, I believe, a single day high or very close to it um, uh, at this point. Uh, and so uh, I, what I would say is if you look back over the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> we've been seeing an increase over a period of time, but this last week really is a, is a dramatic increase. Uh, and I would say that that would put us about a week into a serious Omicron surge, which is a week or two behind um, uh, other states that, uh, that I think went in, um, went in first. Um, we are, I think, beginning to see some breakdown in the linkage between uh, cases and hospitalizations, which is, which is good news. However, a lot of people, I think, are, are misunderstanding what they're hearing. Uh, what, they, what they're hearing is that Omicron cases tend to be 
less severe. And I think people are hearing that as mild. Uh, and, and I think those are two really different things. And, and the problem is the math. It looks like, and this is all still so very early, it's really hard to be definitive, but it looks like people are hospitalized less frequently with Omicron, anywhere from a number seem to indicate 50 to perhaps 70% less likely. The problem is even if you only have 30%, the rate of hospitalization, if you triple or quadruple the number of cases, you still end up with a lot of people in the hospital and still have a lot of capacity to over uh, to overburden the system. So we're, we're keeping a close eye on that. The other thing that's worth observing is that the, um, the number of people hospitalized with COVID is becoming a little bit of a trickier number to understand. Um, we've always basically counted everybody who is in the hospital who has COVID, whether they're in the hospital because of COVID or not, uh, for a variety of reasons of, of, of the difficulty in trying to suss out who's there because of COVID and, and who isn't. Um, as more and more people uh, become infected with Omicron, um, though there are going to be more people in the hospital for a variety of reasons who test positive for COVID. And so that sheer hospitalization number will get more difficult to interpret. So I think we need to, to look at other indicators that we also track and report. The percentage of people who show up in emergency departments uh, reporting uh, COVID symptoms. Um, the number of people with COVID in ICUs, the number of people with COVID who are intubated, indicating obviously um, more serious illness. I think you have to look at that whole package of data to really have a, a good impact. I think the other thing that we're going to uh, keep a very close eye on, because it's really kind of the actionable item, is the percentage of uh, beds that are being occupied by anybody. Um, uh, right now we have, as of yesterday, we had eight or nine percent of our ICU beds available, and we had about six percent of medical surgical beds available. Um, those numbers are not as tight as they were in the uh, peak of the Delta surge, but they're still pretty tight. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we're working to make sure that we've got surge staffing available uh, for, uh, for hospitals uh, to be able to increase their capacity or preserve their capacity. Because one of the challenges we're gonna have, even with um, uh, uh, somewhat um, somewhat easier to manage uh, quarantine and isolation rules, we're going to end up with a lot of staff who end up uh, either sick or, or quarantined because of exposure, and that's going to have an impact um, on, uh, on ho hospital capacity. And that's really going to have an impact on almost everything. You're seeing it today, uh, anywhere from, uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses that are closed for lack of staff to canceled NBA games and uh, all those kinds of things where you're seeing lots of impact of, of disease out in the community. Um, at the time, um, uh, we've been using uh, forecasts from Peter Graven at OHSU, um, and those have been a little bit up and down and a little bit back and forth time-wise, which is to be expected given how new, uh, how new this Omicron variant is and uh, how more data comes in. The, uh, the, the main point is that he's still forecasting a number of hospitalizations that is well above what we experienced in the Delta wave, which really um, uh, was just a bit more than the hospital systems really could accommodate uh, at Delta. So we, we still appear to be heading beyond that. Uh, and he's moved the date of that, uh, that peak up. Um, initially, we were looking at the end of February. Now we're looking at the, uh, at the end of January is where that peak um, should occur according to his most recent model, which he updates weekly. We'll see a new, uh, a new update on Thursday. One of the key pieces of our response has been to continue uh, working on vaccination and especially boosters. Um, uh, Governor announced a challenge to Oregonians for a million people uh, to get boosted. Uh, as of this last weekend, we crossed over 200,000 people who had uh, met that challenge and, and gotten boosted. Um, uh, and that's over, that's over two or three weeks that included Christmas and New Year's. And I'll say, I think the data shows 70 people got uh, boosted on on Christmas, which is you know not super surprising, and uh, it wasn't quite that low on New Year's, but it wasn't it wasn't very many. So now that we're clear of the holidays, I think those numbers um, have got the opportunity to be able to uh, to pick up. So that challenge to Oregonians continues. We also uh, this last week crossed over 100,000 kids aged five to 11 who had gotten uh, at least their first dose. That uh, represents coming up on a third. Um, uh, of, of kids in the state who've now been vaccinated. So that's also, uh, also a good step. And we do continue to see benefits of vaccination, um, uh, uh, even with Omicron, but particularly boosted. 
uh, vaccination. I think if, if people haven't gotten their boosters yet, it's really important, uh, really important to do that uh, because it does have an impact on, uh, on outcomes. Um, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to hit on COVID, but I'd be happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Go for it, Brenda. Thanks, thanks, Director Allen. I have a few for you for today. Uh, the first is about at-home testing. I wonder if you could speak to uh, distribution of tests in communities and then uh, what predictions you have in terms of the impact of the positivity rate, assuming that many of those tests may not be reported through the state database. Sure, thanks. And I'm, I, thanks for asking that. I, that's a topic I should have uh, should have hit. Last week, we inked a deal uh, to acquire 6 million at-home test kits. Uh, each kit has two tests, so that's 12 million tests. That's by an order of magnitude, the biggest uh, uh, testing order that we have uh, ever acquired. Our distribution plan for that is to is uh, several focus areas, to focus on distribution um, uh, uh, to areas or communities and people who are uh, less likely to have ready access to, uh, to at-home tests, uh, either uh, economically or for other reasons. And so we'll be focusing distribution through federally qualified health centers, community-based organizations, local public health departments. Those kinds of things will also be allocating tests um, uh, uh, to help support our test to stay uh, program uh, in local schools. Um, we'll also be allocating tests to healthcare to help with um, the testing requirements to get out of uh, quarantine and isolation earlier. Um, and that's healthcare broadly, uh, broadly constructed. So hospitals, long-term care facilities, uh, Oregon State Hospital, those kinds of uh, those kinds of settings. That's in broad strokes generally how we plan to allocate those tests. Now, in terms of positivity, you're right. Those tests, there's um, there's no mechanism for those tests to essentially be reported. Um, uh, people who test positive may well um, uh, uh, go get a follow-up uh, test that does enter into our electronic uh, lab reporting system, but not automatically. Um, the 18.5% number I talked about today, or 18 plus uh, test positivity, of course, means that there's far more uh, coronavirus out there than we're than we're uh, catching right now. Um, you know, I I, I think. I think a very high proportion of the state is likely to get coronavirus in the next two to three weeks, um, and, and so I think uh, I, I think we're going to have a less accurate understanding, definitive, definitive, definitively of what that number looks like in the next two or three weeks than we have at any point earlier in the pandemic. And the numbers are just so large; there's not a there's not a good way around that. Thank you. Just one more in follow up. Um, are there conversations that are active about mandating the booster for healthcare workers, for educators, you know, similarly as we did in October? Yeah, thanks for the question. There are three jurisdictions around the country right now that have done some kind of a mandate, uh, California, New Mexico and District of Columbia. Um, there is not um, at this time an active proposal to do a mandate. We are reaching out though to various stakeholders, especially in healthcare, uh, and and having conversations uh, that you know could lead to some kind of a discussion about that. But it's not on the table right now. Dr. Santa. Yeah. Thanks, Oscar. Um, well, Pat is. As I've um, asked about before, I mean, my major interest is seniors, because um, that's uh, pretty much my world. Um, and I think you've just made a comment that seniors are increasingly accepting, which uh, they can see um, an overwhelming wave coming at them um, and, uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many friends, former colleagues, family who live in the East um, and you know were disease free have gotten COVID. Um, and so I, I think uh, we know it's coming. And I would just ask um, that all the tools that you know are out there. Um, uh, the state will keep as close track as it can of access to the antibodies. You know, I have a wonderful former physician friend who's very immunosuppressed in the Midwest, got very sick, 
and was very uncomfortable for three to four days because she struggled um, to get um, uh, that antibody infusion, which she got and she turned the corner. Um, so the antibody infusion um, is uh, going to be an issue. You know, you know that. And then, you know, we hear that, uh, so Vermont's getting 120 doses or treatment courses of uh, uh, the Pfizer drug and um, that's gonna be distributed um, based on population. Um, and I think it's going to be uh, focused on the senior population and the immunosuppressed population, but I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think that will be another tool um, that um, seniors will be um, wondering about and watching carefully um, um, as all this uh, uh, comes. Um, and um, so, you know, just wanted to um, highlight those um, issues for people like me. Oh, I'm not, by the way, I'm, I'm a healthy guy. I'm not immunosuppressed. I, I, I don't need any of those things. Um, but I worry about my, um, uh, my senior colleagues. Got it. Um, uh, you'll be pleased to know we've uh, uh, at last check boosted over 55% of everybody 65 and older. That's, I think, the 12th highest grade of boosters in the country. Um, part of our plan in preparation for Omicron was to focus particularly on long-term care, making sure that folks in those facilities uh, have access to access to boosters, and that's that's underway. Monoclonal antibodies is providing a little bit of a challenge right now for a couple of reasons. The first is that uh, the two most available monoclonals uh, have significantly reduced effectiveness against Omicron, uh, but they remain very effective uh, with Delta. The, problem is there's no clinical way to tell whether you have Delta or Omicron at the point that you need to decide um, whether you need antibodies or not. So we've got, we've got that challenge. The other challenge is that the one remaining uh, uh, monoclonal, monoclonal antibody that's effective for Omicron is in extremely short supply. I think our weekly allocation is something like 300 courses, uh, courses of treatment, um, which pretty much in this circumstance rounds to zero. Uh, uh, and so that's a, that's a challenge. In terms of antivirals, uh, you're right, we do expect to start receiving those. Um, uh, but again, in, in very limited supply, we'll have more of the less effective of the two. Um, uh, you know, so that's kind of a, kind of a challenge. Um, uh, and the other challenge is that they need to be administered very early in the course of your illness within three days. Um, uh, uh, for the Merck drug and within three to five days for the, for the Pfizer drug. And so you're right, those, when it's initially in short supply, we're going to be trying to put those doses close to where people most vulnerable are most quickly able to get, uh, get those courses of treatment and see those start. Other questions? Just one more about surge capacity. Um, you mentioned uh, what we're doing in the hospital systems, and I, I recognize there's sort of word out there about other healthcare settings, including FQHCs. Could you speak a little bit about how that will work in your mind, or as you envision it? Yeah. Yeah. So part of what we're going to need to work through is kind of a kind of a um, prioritization and allocation of resources. We don't have enough human beings to meet all of the staffing needs that are out there in, in a variety of settings, particularly including hospitals, long-term care, uh, dialysis centers. So those three in particular are, are um, uh, acute shortage areas and they're interrelated to each other. Um, it, you may need dialysis to be able to get out of the hospital or you need a bed in a, in a um, skilled nursing facility. And if those facilities aren't staffed, then that compounds the challenges in, in hospitals. If we end up at 1600, people hospitalized with COVID, we are going to stretch beyond capacity and we're gonna have really challenging circumstances in all of those care settings. We're working right now. Um, we have in fact already acquired um, uh, staffing resources similar to uh, what we got during the Delta surge and we've got those ready to, to be able to deploy and we're working on trying to figure out what are the highest priorities to, to um, uh, relieve as much pressure as we can in the system. <clears throat> Any other questions from board members? All right, well, thank you so much, Director Allen, for your leadership and for 
uh, the dedication of everyone on OHA during this uh, challenging time. So, Thanks, I appreciate that. Okay, so next we are going to have Director Allen also and OHA Health uh, Policy and Analytics Director Jeremy Vandehey uh, present an overview on OHA's complementary bodies of work that make up Oregon's health reform roadmap. Uh, many efforts within this work are closely aligned and related to OHPB priorities and highlight how OHPB, its committees, and OHA are contributing to this unified effort to ensure equitable quality health care for Oregonians. Uh, go ahead and take it away, uh, Director Allen and Jeremy. Great, thanks very much. Um, and my share on, as you indicate, um, uh, this is really about kind of a unified body of work. We're used to coming to you regularly and talking about individual individual buckets, whether it's the cost growth target or the 1115 waiver or those kinds of things. And I think what often can happen is they can sort of feel like these discrete things that aren't maybe necessarily connected to each other other than they all involve uh, the health authority, the health policy board, and so on. <clears throat> what we want to really do today is lay out for you what the overall roadmap of health reform broadly looks like and how these bodies of work um, really fit together. Let's go to the next slide. So Jeremy and I are going to tag team this a little bit. I'll kind of set the stage, and then Jeremy will talk about the some of the details in the bodies of work. We've been doing healthcare reform in Oregon for a really long time. Uh, and we've really made some huge gains um, over the nearly 30 years, I would say, that we've been actively engaged in this. We've pulled out some data points here. I think most importantly, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that we've made dramatic increases in uh, the percentage of Oregonians who are insured. Um, uh, Affordable Care Act was a big, but not the only piece of that, um, uh, with the legislature taking actions like Cover All Kids and now Cover All People uh, to, to get better and better insurance coverage rates. Um, and insurance isn't in the end in and of itself. Insurance really is what connects you to the healthcare system, gives you access to good uh, uh, quality primary care in particular. Um, and, and, and that's got multiple, uh, multiple benefits. On the left-hand side, you can see some places where we've improved uh, health and delivery. These are not the only two things we've improved, but we pulled those data points out. And we've driven down costs over the, um, uh, over the course of this process. So we really are trying to achieve, we are seeing gains on the entire triple aim of uh, better health, better care at lower cost. Next slide. But we we obviously not sort of finished this work. There's a lot uh, there's a lot that's still on the table for us to be able to accomplish. From an equity standpoint, communities of color are much less likely to be insured. Um, this is really a, uh, this bore itself out during the pandemic when that lack of insurance led to lack of connectedness to a care system, which impacted the ability for people to get tested, to be able to get vaccinated. Uh, to get support for uh, quarantine and isolation, all those kinds of things that uh, in the first year of the pandemic really magnified um, uh, the inequities that the, that the pandemic uh, caused. Um, uh, you can also see on the right-hand side that we still have a lot of work to do on the cost side. Um, of particular note, 29% of a family's total income um, uh, uh, is the amount that gets spent on health insurance premiums, not necessarily by the family itself. That may be an employer, um, or, a, or a public system, but it's a bunch of our total collective family income that goes toward, uh, toward health, health insurance premiums. Next slide. So um, this is a little bit of a riff on some work uh, by uh, the Commonwealth Fund that really looked comparatively at a variety of uh, healthcare systems um, around the world. Um, uh, and as always is the case in these uh, systems, you find that the United States spends a lot of money for uh, for worse outcomes almost entirely across the board. And it's not just a little more money, it's a lot more money that gets spent. What Commonwealth found is that there are some, uh, some basic characteristics of high performing systems that are out there. Um, that They all provide um, uh, affordable universal coverage. The, that coverage leads to high value primary care. Um, that they make investments in social services, either through a robust social safety net or other investments in um, social uh, social determinants of health and, and health equity. Uh, and uh, to Dr. Santa's favorite point, they're, they're all administratively much 
less complicated than our systems are and devote less resources to that. Uh, what I'd like to do now is show some, some pieces of how we've been trying in Oregon to make, uh, make progress on uh, in those four buckets. So let's add the bullets if we could on the next slide. There we go. So under affordable uh, coverage, already talked about the fact that uh, the Affordable Care Act um, and other investments have uh, have increased our, our coverage to um, high levels. Uh, we think there's still an opportunity to get higher uh, higher yet. And when we think about that coverage being, affor uh, being affordable, we, we think about the statewide cost growth target, the 3.5, 3.4% target number we've been using for a long time in um, uh, in uh, coordinated care organization premiums, um, those work together to deliver that affordable universal coverage. In terms of um, high value in primary care, um, we've been using the primary uh, primary care home model statewide, and we've been incenting that um, as a way to deliver care. Uh, one of our very earliest reforms, the prioritized list um, of conditions and treatments, really aims to try to make sure everyone's got access to the most effective and most cost-effective treatments uh, rather than some subset of everyone getting access to, uh, to things that are not as valuable. Um, we've been using coordinated care organizations now for a number of years to really try to integrate care, um, uh, and we've been pushing them hard uh, around, uh, around how that works. Uh, and then we've moved the coordinated care uh, uh, system into the employee benefit plans we have through PEB and OEB, which uh, and now um, a large majority, for instance, of PEB members are on a, uh, are on basically a CCO-like plan um, uh, for their benefits. In terms of investing in social services, we've done a lot, but particularly with CCOs and how uh, how their rates are set uh, and what they're able to spend money on to push money spending upstream to try to impact health before it turns into into healthcare. Uh, and then in terms of uh, administrative ease, we've done we've taken some steps that I think have um, have helped. We've got a, a, a quality committee that aligns metrics so that we're not trying to measure the same thing in a million different ways across different payer systems. Um, there's a value based payment compact work group um, uh, that's working on doing value based payment structures similarly again so the providers don't go blind trying to figure out which which incentives they're trying to achieve depending on who's paying the paying the bill. And then really the creation of OHA is a step toward that administrative uh, uh, simplification. We pay for the care for about 40% of Oregonians today. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, we're able to uh, align things like value-based payment systems, cost growth targets, um, uh, all of those systems and incentives to try to use our purchasing power to leverage that, that change and simplification. Next slide. Then you, uh, uh, you established um, uh, our marvelous uh, uh, health equity definition, um, and we've adopted health equity really as not just a value that the agency pays attention to, but the point of, of our work uh, overall, a 10-year goal of eliminating health inequities in the state using this definition. And what I really keep coming back to over and over again as I look at this definition is this notion of the uh, equitable distribution of redistribution of resources and power, the work that uh, uh, that you had us do over the last several months, looking at how we make a, you know, something basic like how we make appointments uh, to uh, boards and and uh, subcommittees and those kinds of things, I think is a is a powerful um, endorsement of that notion of um, of redistribution of power. Who's at the table making decisions and recommendations, and um, uh, and how does how does that process work? Next slide. So what we really need to do is focus the system on, uh, on equity. We need to be sure that everyone's got access to affordable care. I touched on uh, cover all people a minute ago. That's the legislative investment of $100 million in making sure that anyone who is otherwise eligible for um, uh, a Medicaid-like coverage is able to get on the Oregon Health Fund regardless of their uh, immigration status. Um, the $100 million is a serious down payment, it's, um, but it's not all of the costs, so we still have a lot of work uh, to do there. We want to make sure everyone's got access to that uh, core set of high value uh, benefits, and that those benefits are delivered in a way that's culturally responsive and actually gets access to people. Again, we found um, during, the, uh, during the first year of the pandemic, I can't believe I'm saying the first year of the pandemic, um, uh, uh, that... Uh, Working through the ordinary 
healthcare channels that we worked through was insufficient uh, in a lot of populations in the state. And we needed to partner differently with, with different folks. And so one of the things coming out of the pandemic um, that is going to be a lasting uh, tool and, and value for OHA is working with a much broader array of community-based organizations to try to deliver um, those services and, and connection. We need to use a, 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 a fixed cost global budget to deliver care. We're learning to be a little bit careful about the phrase global budget because in some parts of the country, um, they hear global budget and, and they think that we mean a per capita cap and block granting of healthcare, which is not at all uh, what we mean. What we really mean is sustainable long-term uh, financing for healthcare uh, that, uh, that, that provides for its increase in costs to not outstrip our ability to earn money to pay, uh, to pay for it. And then we need plan designs and contracts and all the things that we've talked about administratively that try to align with common expectations um, uh, for how to incent quality, how to get e equity and access all those all those kinds of things. What Jeremy's now going to do is really talk about in those uh, in those buckets, what's the work that we're doing? How do the different efforts that you've heard about um, sort of one by one over the last while and the work that you're doing as a board, how do they all relate to being able to, uh, to deliver that comprehensive system? So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Um, thanks, Pat. Um, and, you know, I think what Pat outlined is, you know, we've been on a, we've been on a course to really try to get to the, the place of um, these features of of high high functioning, high performing health systems um, in other countries, um, we have more work to do. But we've got a lot of the work and a lot of the ingredients that are in motion um, and and are getting us closer and closer there. Um, as we've sort of taken a step back of, um, especially the last couple of legislative sessions, including this this last one last year, and the direction that we're getting from the legislature, you know, we we are clearly getting um, uh, the commitment and and direction that. Um, that we are a state where, um, from a policy perspective, want everybody to have access to high, high quality, affordable health care. That moving to the spot where there's not some people who have access and some people who don't, um, and getting to that spot of universal coverage and universal access. Um, and as we've thought about that, that really starts, starts to free you up, uh, free us up as a state to think about, okay, if we're, if we're moving to a spot where everybody's going to be covered. Um, then how do we actually really start to think about simplifying the system and making it easier both for consumers but also um, easier to be able to achieve our health equity goals and be trying to point these different markets and different programs um, in a similar direction uh, why don't we go to the next slide and i believe if we're able to do that we actually can achieve our equity goals faster because we can set common expectations we can be trying to really push the delivery system um, in, in the same direction um, so as we've looked at all the work that's that's sort of in flight, um, it, it I feel like it's, it actually points in a, a pretty clear roadmap of, of where we're headed, and, and we think it looks like this. Um, first is continuing to um, drive towards um, universal um, health insurance coverage and, and covering every person in the state. Um, second, and, and in tandem with that, is getting costs under control and making sure uh, the healthcare is a, is affordable, and, and that's uh, uh, sort of chicken and egg with universal coverage. You really need to be doing both at the same time. And then the third is um, continuing to push forward on our delivery system and market reforms and, and really um, pushing more in the direction of, um, of, of health equity and, and alignment across uh, markets. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide. So in terms of universal coverage, um, really see sort of a, a four-step approach. Um, first is, you know, we, as Pat mentioned, we've had um, huge gains over the last 10 years, but we, we know, and we've talked a lot this, about this a lot over the last several months with you all, we know that there's still more work to do. There's um, significant inequities in terms of who has coverage. There's obviously a lot of disruption um, as a result of the pandemic and the economy. Uh, and so it's a bit of a moving, a moving target, but, uh, but we also can see, um, we can also sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel. So first is not losing ground. Uh, we've made significant gains. Um, um, both through the Affordable Care Act, but also through the pandemic, um, while we have paused eligibility redeterminations for, for Medicaid, we've had um, almost 300,000 more folks enroll um, and expect that um, more people actually have insurance today than, than did uh, before the pandemic as, as a result of, of, medic, of growth within Medicaid. Um, we would eventually have to start doing eligibility redeterminations again, um, expect that several hundred thousand folks Will come off of Medicaid, and so step one is not losing ground and trying to uh, create a soft landing for those folks and, and a warm handoff to the marketplace if that's where they're eligible, or, or if they continue to be eligible for the for Medicaid, making it easier for uh, for them to, to stay in. 
Um, the second is continuing to fill in the gaps um, of of um, uh, of who doesn't have access. Cover all people is the is the most um, uh, glaring um, gap of of folks who are, um, are low income but um, but remain remain ineligible under the Affordable Care Act, and that will move us um, significantly uh, in, in that direction of getting universal coverage. Um, and then and then a little longer term. Um, both thinking about how do we change some of the eligibility processes and rules uh, within both the Oregon Health Plan as well as the marketplace to make it easier for folks who are eligible to get in and stay in. Um, and well, we've talked a lot about that with um, uh, with the 1115 waiver is, is really trying to get people once they're in to make it easier for them to stay in as, as long as they remain eligible. Um, and then a bit longer term, uh, legislatures um, asked us uh, to bring back an option for a public a public option within the marketplace and are considering longer term on the commercial insurance side, how could the marketplace potentially be simplified uh, uh, and, and redesigned to make it um, more affordable and make it easier for folks to enroll? Um, next slide. Next slide. Uh, in terms of, uh, of cost growth, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about this. As, as you all know, we've launched a statewide cost growth target um, and, and have pegged a target of 3.4% um, uh, per capita growth for the next five years and a reduction down to 3%. Um, you know, obviously, this is where we land in this is uh, as a result of the pandemic. Nobody really knows, but the whole goal of this was, is a long game. It isn't about um, sort of declaring failure or success in a given year. It's really about trying to bend that cost curve long term and get our rate of growth uh, more in line with uh, with with other economic indicators. Uh, next slide. Um, this will apply statewide, which is really a movement um, away from. Um, a lot of our health reform work that's been really focused primarily on state programs, on Medicaid or public employee programs, and really starting to take more of a statewide view of, of how do we get um, value up, how do we get um, costs under control um, statewide uh, across all markets. Um, next slide. Um, the, the significance of this cannot be overstated. Um, we'll recognize that um, healthcare cost growth target. Well, we spend a lot of time talking about it. It's probably never going to be dinner table conversation, um, but the importance of it is is really significant. Um, you know, sort of equate this to getting a better interest rate on your mortgage or student loans uh, may not may not make a big difference or feel like it makes a big difference in a given month, but over the course um, of of time, and you're talking about um, you know twenty thirty billion dollars of healthcare spending. Um, re reducing that rate of growth is really, really huge. And the difference between the targets we've set and CMS's projections for healthcare costs um, over the next um, several years, uh, it it's, equates to $16 billion of savings if we're able to hit this target. And that's $16 billion uh, that's, that's not going to healthcare that can go to other parts of the economy, whether that's retirement or wages or, uh, or, or other investments in education or, or critical places. Um, next slide. Um, so then as we move into sort of the delivery system reform, um, sort of sort of see a, a three-step approach here too. One, um, continuing to push forward with the coordinated care model within uh, within Medicaid and, and, um, and utilizing the 1115 waiver to really push uh, uh, CCOs and the, and the Medicaid program um, uh, in the direction of, um, of really being zeroed in on, on, on health equity. Um, and then thinking about um, uh, other other markets to follow, including um, uh, where we go next with public employee programs and uh, and marketplace. Um, we've got the key goals of the LUM 15 waiver um, in the next several slides. I'll just I'll go through these pretty quick because we've spent so much time over the last couple of months. Um, but uh, but as as we think about uh, Medicaid and uh, and the Oregon Health Plan being really um, uh, really zeroed in on uh, on addressing equity, have have seen four four key goals that align with um, with our overall roadmap. You know uh, where where we can expand coverage and and help uh, drive towards universal coverage through um, changes in, in eligibility and enrollment within uh, within Medicaid. Um, trying to really break down some of those silos and, and walls that exist between Medicaid and other public programs, um, or between healthcare and, and social services, and trying to really have a health system that that stays with people as they're going through different life events and gets them um, uh, the health services um, that they need to be healthy. Um, continue to push towards um, uh, more of a, a value-based uh, uh, population payment um, that really encourages more flexible spending and uh, while staying within a budget we can afford um, and, and beginning and continuing to shift resources to the community um, and to health equity investments. Um, again, I'll, I'll go through the next couple of slides pretty, pretty quickly. Um, next slide. 
Um, for in terms of coverage, we've talked about um, moving to um, a five-year continuous enrollment for kids, two-year continuous enrollment for adults, um, and uh, and one um, income verification for for SNAP and Medicaid. Again, the idea being um, trying to get those folks who are eligible in and making it easier for for them to stay in once once they're enrolled. Oh, next slide. Um, we've talked about uh, and, and, uh, and have a number of things in the waiver related to uh, breaking down some of the silos between the behavioral health system or public safety system, uh, both for um, youth and adults, um, and trying to keep people uh, better connected to their community providers um, as they're moving between uh, uh, moving between different uh, public systems. Um, trying to um, really uh, create more flexibility or make it easier for providers to um, know what um, health related services or social services, especially around housing and climate events, um, people can have ac access to um, and trying to really continue to um, build out the model of, of stronger connection between healthcare and CCOs um, and other community based uh, organizations. Um, next slide. Um, we're proposing in the waiver um, the most aggressive movement to a, a sort of value-based um, global budget, and, and what we mean by a global budget is really moving to a prospective, really popular, you know, long-term population payment. Um, uh, this would be the most sort of movement towards a, a true global budget that, um, that that we've ever proposed or, or seen, and it would really create a long-term. Um, uh, predictable budget for the health system um, that would grow at um, our cost growth target um, and and we hope would really incent uh, more and more investments upstream into prevention and, and other things that will reduce costs and improve health outcomes um, long term. Um, next slide. Um, we've, we've talked about um, moving the quality pool to be really um, centered in equity um, and using the very significant investments from the from the quality program um, to be tied towards um, uh, uh, metrics that are specifically aimed at addressing equity and, and really moving us from not just uh, aligning our quality metrics, but actually putting those quality metrics uh, or having those quality metrics be specifically uh, aimed at addressing equity. Uh, next slide. And we're also asking for um, some additional federal investments, um, some shared savings, if you will, um, to be able to shift resources to the community and uh, continue to expand the uh, the infrastructure and um, and ability for the community to really um, direct um, decision making and direct resources to address equity and address health. Um, next slide. Um, so that's sort of the, the bucket of, of, of Medicaid pieces. Um, uh, the next step we see beyond that is really starting to align those with um, things that we're expecting uh, within our public employee programs or, um, or the marketplace. As Pat mentioned, we as an agency, um, basically facilitate or purchase people having health insurance from more than 40% of the state. And so a big piece of this is if we really want to simplify the system and have common expectations is a bit of getting our own house in order and saying, let's let's have similar expectations um, or, or the same expectations across markets. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of the same players, whether that's um, health plans or whether that's hospitals or clinics. Um, that are serving um, different populations, but we right now often um, set you know similar but not quite the same expectations, um, and and that and by aligning those more closely, we think we can get to our goals um, quicker. Um, next slide. So broadly, um, sort of see at least three major components of um, where we could be better aligned. One is um, really in the um, arena of um, of affordability and and changing the financial system. Um, incentives in the system um, to, to really build out common expectations for the cost growth target and, um, and getting total cost of care under control across markets um, and, and setting that common expectation. And also um, really pushing towards um, value-based payments and changing how we're paying providers um, to, to promote um, health and promote value. Um, see a big opportunity to be um, doing more alignment of our expectations around health equity as, and including quality and outcome measures. Um, as we're pushing CCOs um, to be um, focused on equity and to be um, uh, having quality measures that are focused on equity, um, that to remember that that's that's our lowest uh, paying system in terms of provider reimbursement, and and yet we expect more <laughs> in a lot of cases than we do from our plans in the commercial market, um, and so need to sort of bring um, our commercial plans along um, and and really set a common. Um, common accountability towards equity and quality across those markets. 
Um, another area where, where Medicaid is way out ahead is around community of voice. We have very robust, and, and while we've got a lot more work to do to increase community voice um, uh, and, and, um, and redistribute resources and decision-making, um, Medicaid is light years ahead of the commercial market in terms of, of the, the pieces we have in place. We have community advisory councils, there's community health improvement plans, there's equity plans. None of that exists in the commercial market. Um, and so really think there's an opportunity to build off of what uh, what we've built with CCOs and, and community voice and how the health system functions um, and, uh, and bring that into the commercial market as well. Oh, next slide. Um, and then finally, a, a bit further out, um, also coming from out of the legislature, uh, uh, this last session was uh, a directive that we come up with a, pro a proposal for a pilot um, that would really bring um, all of these markets together um, under a common multi-payer uh, budget in a community. And so thinking about could we uh, more robustly um, uh, bring the populations and, and dollars from Medicaid, um, from uh, public employee programs, marketplace, and potentially Medicare into what really what looks like more of a, a single population payment uh, to a community um, that would really push farther towards um, a line reimbursement model um, and, and align metrics. Um, so this is a work that's still kind of on the on the front end, but. Um, but our federal partners with um, CMMI have indicated that they're very much interested in something like this uh, going forward. They really want to figure out how to um, do something that's a bit uh, bigger and, and really starts to align across pairs. Um, and so uh, we're not talking about merging all these markets together, but think about, uh, you know, a health plan potentially having a more unified contract with a provider or hospital that sets, you know, has a common payment met methodology and common quality metrics across these markets. Uh, right now, often, um, uh, you know, I'll hear from a hospital that they've got, you know, seven or 10 or 14 different contracts with a single health insurance company, slicing and dicing populations with different quality metrics and different payment arrangements and trying to figure out how do you actually align that across the markets. Uh, next slide. Um, so general general timeline, and I'd say this is pretty loose. We obviously we sort of built this out before Delta and before Omicron, but just kind of giving us a general uh, direction. Um, uh, we'll be submitting the 1115 waiver um, in uh, in February um, next month. Um, we've just submitted a plan uh, for a public option program to the legislature. Uh, that would require additional enabling legislation and 1332 waivers. Um, we're planning a marketplace um, summit with, um, with stakeholders later this month to review that plan and, and talk to begin some discussions around uh, wh what should the health insurance marketplace look like um, longer term uh, and how does a public option and, and other things fit within that. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, in response to um, House Bill 2010, we're building out a, a concept paper and, and a report that will go back to the legislature and that we also uh, would like to uh, bounce off our federal partners around what would something look like that was uh, really more of a multi-payer, uh, multi-payer aligned um, global budget model uh, and, and whether that requires, but it certainly would require more legislation and potentially a waiver. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit farther off uh, in the future. So we just really wanted to kind of lay this out here. We were, we were expecting a retreat in a couple of weeks. And so wanted to, I think, largely just be able to show how there's a lot of pieces that maybe don't look aligned that we really do think are aligned and are really are pushing us in a, in a direction and just wanted to sort of lay this out for, uh, for discussion ahead of the retreat. The questions are stacking up. Thank you, Director Allen and Jeremy. Uh, I saw Bill's hand first. I th thanks very much, Jeremy and Patrick, for this uh, really good roadmap and uh, particularly intrigued by this, um, uh, this last section on alignment, which I think can be a very powerful uh, way to uh, drive reform since uh, many providers, as you say, face conflicting um, incentives, conflicting expectations about um, quality and, and outcomes, not to mention um, the payment method. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is exactly the right place to start, but I wonder what your thinking is about how um, commercial plans or commercial purchasers um, might be um, included in some way. And I understand that they're, most of them are far, farther behind um, the uh, Medicaid and PEB, the web uh, and the marketplace. But there are some empl employers who I think would like to be inter uh, interested in, in joining in at a minimum in terms of things like common measure, uh, performance measures 
and um, common contracting. So what are your thoughts about um, whether and how to include uh, commercial plans and purchasers in this alignment effort? Let me jump in just quickly and then and then pitch it to uh, to Jeremy. I think um, this is one of the areas where where sort of the the uniqueness of Oregon's individual health insurance market becomes just a huge advantage. You know, we don't we don't have big national players mostly um, who are you know sort of tangentially connected to Oregon. The the players uh, in the in the Medicaid market, the players in Medicare Advantage plans, the players in the individual market are the same damn people. Um, and and it's, it's not that they're necessarily behind, it's just that we do things differently in different payer segments. Um, but even within the, those payer segments, different, uh, different um, commercial insurers are, are beginning to approach some of this in a, in, a, in a way that's receptive to this. But the whole idea um, of moving the, the marketplace back into OHA or into OHA was really <clears throat> aimed at this kind of an issue of being able to think about how to use active purchaser provisions in contracting on the marketplace as an example, as a way to begin to uh, begin to drive that. But let me, with that as just a kind of an intro, let me pitch it to Jeremy. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't think it can be overstated. The, the, the key ingredient we have that other states don't have that we have um, you know, five domestic insurers that cover most of the most of the lives in the state in, in some form or fashion through across these markets, um, and are also the, you know, the TPA in a lot of cases for even employers who are self insured. Um, you know, we, under federal law, we can't sort of force employers one way or the other, but what we can do is set common expectations across insurers. And what we can do is align the 40% of the lives that we have within, within OHA and I think sort of lead by example and, and invite others in. Um, you know, we're the, we're the largest um, in, in public employees, uh, we're the largest self-insured employer in the state with 100,000 lives and um, a self-insured um, uh, uh, block of business with um, that, that Providence is our TPA. Um, uh, so from a scale perspective, you know, I think we have a huge opportunity to sort of lead by example and, um, and, and to bring others in. Um, and, and so how, how we do that exactly, you know, I think it's been a, a challenge to, to engage with the business community around this for a number of years um, for a variety of reasons. One, just being, uh, you know, organizationally sort of how to engage exactly uh, with folks and there's varying levels. Um, you know, I think there's all have also heard that, um, at least anecdotally, you know, when we've had very low um, uh, uh, unemployment rates, um, have heard that there's a bit of nervousness from employers talking about health reform because they're worried it gets conflated with benefits cuts. And so just trying to figure out how to engage that conversation is something that we're, uh, we're, we're constantly kind of struggling with, but, uh, but would love to be able to work with some, some other uh, private employers in the state and, and, uh, and bring them in. That's great. Thanks very much. Um... Uh, I, I totally agree that there it has been a challenge to engage with um, even large employers uh, in Oregon. Uh, I think that there is a movement within the employer community to, to recognizing that that hasn't paid off for them <laughs> that, or that their, their go it alone approach uh, and um, that aligning with uh, public sector programs, whether it's uh, through the marketplace or the state employee plans could be really beneficial. And I think at least on a voluntary basis, there will be a number that would be interested in working with um, the Oregon Health Authority on this. So look forward to working with you on that, uh, on that piece of this. <clears throat> Director Santa, Dr. Santa. Yeah, thanks, Oscar. Well, uh, Jeremy, you should know that as I listened um, to your presentation, my Fitbit signaled uh, that my heart rate um, had significantly increased. Uh, so I will try to get through this without, you know, disappearing from the screen. Um, a, a, a minor comment and then a couple of, I think, major ones. I was disappointed to see the slide on metrics describe the upstream metrics as a small subset. I've disagreed with the use of the term small. Um, it had disappeared from the slides in the waiver discussions, and I would urge it disappear from this. It's inconsistent that you start a presentation with appropriate praise for metrics, and then at a crucial point, when it relates to equity, say that only a small number will be needed. One of the most significant moments in 2021 
at the OHPB was when that question came up of how will we measure and know when we're successful? And my recollection is that an OHA staff person carried that moment when she said, we'll know when the people who've been treated inequitably say so. We're presuming that we can accomplish that with a small set of metrics. We shouldn't presume that. So that's a, a minor point. Um, my major concern, and I, I think the reason my, my heart rate increased is this unusual mix of joy and fear. Um, I'm joyful because when I opened this yesterday afternoon, I was, you know, thrilled, stunned um, at um, you all putting this on the table. I, I wondered, you know, why it wasn't on the table or some of these issues weren't on the table earlier, but they now are. And um, now this is a very ambitious agenda. Um, and, um, you know, ambition thrills me, um, uh, but it's, um, uh, challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that um, I'm eager to hear a lot more about the two 1332 waivers. I'm eager to see the paper that was submitted to uh, CMMI in the fall. Um, uh, and it's great to have um, a discussion about a multi-payer value-based budget. Um, I am concerned that this doesn't include um, something that the legislature put on the table in 2019. And that's uh, Senate Bill 770 um, that had bipartisan support, created the Task Force for Universal Coverage and explores a single payer. And it, it, it's time that everything be on the table and that we seriously look at the advantages and disadvantages of multi-payer uh, versus single-payer um, approaches. Because I believe much of the cost problem we have relates to excessive costs that multi-payers bring around risk. And it, it's time for us to get rid of those costs. You know, I could easily describe what you're talking about as a market-based value-based budget, because you are trying to regulate a market to produce the same result that a single payer um, could produce. So, you know, I, I, I do think in fairness, um, this effort needs to have everything on the table that the legislature has supported. Um, and, um, you know, we need to discuss um, all of those uh, options. Um, you know, I, I would just close with, um, you, you use the phrase dinner table. Um, you know, earlier, I mean, I can tell you for people my age, healthcare is the major dinner table conversation we have. It's what we talk about all the time. And, you know, most of the people I relate to um, are at healthcare systems on a weekly, monthly basis. And it's not a pretty picture. You don't want to hear how even privileged people um, like my friends are uh, treated um, uh, in some cases by some um, healthcare systems. If it wasn't COVID, I'd be saying, Jeremy, I'd like to line up a series of dinners for you um, uh, to sit down with um, folks who do talk about this. Um, so, um, you know, when, when I opened this up and I, and I also saw David's note that, well, we might end early. I thought, wow, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not gonna interfere with that, but there is a lot here. Thank you for putting it on the table. 
Um, let's get at it, um, but let's add um, uh, the other element the legislature has uh, uh, endorsed um, and really get down and, and uh, uh, figure out how we can best do this. Thanks. Thanks, John. Appreciate all the feedback and uh, hopefully your blood pressure is staying somewhat intact. But I will just say uh, not to disregard or under, understate some of your comments before. I think there is a, a little bit of just some a couple of these slides were a little outdated. We haven't submitted something to CMMI yet. Um, as I mentioned, that was kind of a timeline we had a, a month ago. Um, so I really appreciate the comments. Kristen. Hey, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Jeremy and Pat, uh, for laying this out for us. And, um, you know, I think I, I agree with some of the points that Dr. Santa made, but I also just want to say that I'm proud to live in a state where there is a kind of a vision for an equitable, affordable healthcare system and, and a real will to, to demand something different and something better. So uh, thank you for your vision and leadership and all of those who are part of that. Um, I had a very narrow question. You talked about um, kind of redeterminations and I really appreciate the focus on that and thinking ahead about that kind of pivotal moment and all those real lives um, that will be in flux when that happens. Um, and, and you mentioned kind of a possible public option as helping ease that transition to a, ideally an affordable plan on the marketplace. And I was curious related to the public option proposal, kind of um, what elements of, of OHA's plan will make that public option more affordable than what is currently offered? Um, and, and what are the steps to kind of ensure provider participation and if there's a, any goals around kind of geographic availability of that plan. Yeah, I, um, without going to spend the whole rest of the morning, I guess to Dr. Stanis' point, we probably have you know an extra hour we could spend just on public option. We, we submitted, um, but, but just again, give you the summary. So we submitted a report um, that was due January 1st to, to the legislature. Um, it was on a very fast, fast timeline. We had Manat Health um, help us work with that. Um, really see it as, you know, the next, not not a final product, but the next step in the conversation around where do we go with the marketplace? It largely um, makes some recommendations. Matt makes some recommendations around you know tr trying to balance what the legislation called for, which was um, building off the CCO model, um, you know, supporting the goals of, of health equity, um, really driving towards some um, affordability and universal coverage. Um, what they've outlined is is largely. Um, following um, a proposal that Colorado has um, just recently submitted um, to CMS um, for a 1332 waiver to create uh, a public option. Uh, what, what, what it is, and a public option is sort of one of these things, so like single payer sort of means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so setting the term public option aside for a second, what Colorado is proposing is basically a new, a new standardized um, health plan uh, that, that, that um, insurers would offer. Um, that would re be required to hit um, 5, 10, and 15% premium reductions over the next three years, um, and that they would capture that savings from the federal government and use it to buy down out-of-pocket costs. The mechanism that Colorado is proposing is basically a, a carrot and a stick. The carrot is um, carriers go figure out how to do it. <laughs> and if you can't figure out how to do it, then they would go in and rebase re reimbursement rates to achieve those savings. Um, it would require a federal uh, uh, federal approval that they haven't received yet. No states received a 1332 waiver um, for anything other than reinsurance programs. So nobody really knows um, what the appetite will be. Um, what Manat uh, basically proposed was it was building off that model with some differences. One would be, um, you know, rather than a, a 5, 10, 15 percent premium reduction, that there would be some type of rebasing of, re of reimbursement rates to sort of standardize those. Um, and that that would that would create a sort of a one time savings and then going forward trend the basically trend uh, premiums in the marketplace to the cost growth target um, and to do that to uh, by basically moving towards a model of developing premiums that's more like we do it within Medicaid where we're actually setting the rate as opposed to premium instead of insurers coming and asking for a, approval so. 
Um, they, they also um, uh, propose a number of things that would be bringing elements of the coordinated care model more into the into those plans, including um, you know requiring things like health equity plans and, and building off the community health and uh, health improvement model. Um, uh, you know, connecting to um, community advisory councils and um, and regional health equity coalitions. So, not bringing the CCOs per se into the market marketplace, so that could be an option. But bringing those elements and aligning those elements of of the coordinated care model uh, with those plans. Um, the the modeling that the Matt did showed that basically, if we did offer such a plan on the marketplace, you'd you'd in essence eliminate all the other plans because the savings would be high enough that the whole market would just move that direction. So I think the conversation that we're going to have later this month um, through the marketplace advisory committee uh, and and bring some other partners in is just to start to say, okay, if you put a plan like this on the market, you're you're in essence disrupting the market enough that you are creating a new market, and so. What should that new What should that new market longer term look like? Um, and that's sort of a longer term thing. And, and in the nearer term, uh, we do have um, this cliff of of the eligibility redeterminations that we need to be focused on. And so, you know, there are things we can be doing in the near term to help with that. You know, while sort of holding a longer term vision of of where where you know, is there some ways to simplify the marketplace and make it more affordable? So, sorry, that's kind of a lot to throw out there, but that's the the general gist. It's a little bit it's a little bit off off topic, but it's a, a good place to also just kind of highlight for the board the fact that as we go into those redeterminations, um, uh, uh, ODHS has already um, publicly talked about the fact that it's working through a backlog um, of uh, eligibility transactions, the, the larger number of which are in the uh, health plan determinations, and and so um, there are some concerns about. Um, how that redetermination work will go if uh, if we can't get the backlog cleaned up and try to get as many people as seamlessly as possible moved over to moved over to other plans. Uh, thank you, Pat and Jeremy. That actually is a good segue to my question. I'm I'm thinking about how transformation works in the context of first creating that big vision that you just really articulated. I think for us as a board. And then the levels and details of tactics that follow that vision, that you also kind of gave us a high level view of a few component parts and where both of you just left off was this question of obstacles, right? Recognizing that in this kind of a vision, we should be anticipating obstacles for ourselves as a board, for the agency, like internally to us, what are those obstacles that we need to have in mind so that we develop plans that actually address them in a really transparent way. And then the obstacles, I think, in the systems itself. So I'm interested in thinking about how perhaps in our retreat, we articulate these you know, for ourselves. So the ones that we have presumably some influence or control over, the obstacles that are external to us that are more in the marketplace itself or with other people who resist this kind of transition and change. What you're describing is quite comprehensive. And I agree with Dr. Santa in its in its palpitations in different ways. So I think being really clear and transparent about what you're envisioning those resistance points to be and naming them for us would be really helpful. And then I think thirdly, the obstacle of our environment. So where and when and in pacing and in timing that we think that we're gonna attack each one of these kind of core components, whether that be at the high level vision and the directional place and getting super clear on that, whether that be in the tactics themselves and what happens sort of in sequence with one another or where those obstacles and our influences with them are both known to us and then what the approaches are to sort of address them. So I offer that as a frame as we think about our rescheduled retreat and, and coming into that more exploratory conversation so that we can wrap our, our heads, our minds, our our hearts around the transformation itself so we can make kind of that continued sustained change that we in Oregon have done in the past. Yeah, thanks, Brenda. That's really helpful. And um, I think a really helpful frame to be thinking about and, um, uh, you know, could probably spend the rest of the day thinking about rattling off one obstacle after another. I mean, there's no shortage. Um, and, and I think the most obvious one being um, it, it's a fragmented system now for a whole bunch of reasons um, with a whole bunch of different ways these markets are regulated um, and a bunch of different players. And 
you know, in, in some degree, that's just happenstance how it's come together. In some degree, it actually works well for a system that doesn't want to change, right? It works well for a system that doesn't want to change to have, you know, 10 different negotiations with the state instead of one big one. Um, but I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I think the way I sort of thought about this presentation is, is trying recognizing that there's going to be a million obstacles, but can we kind of hold our long term vision out there? And as each, each, you know, thing comes up, whether that's a procurement or whether that's a legislative session or whatever, you know, be trying to recognize that we're, we're we've kind of got a, a, a vision of where we're trying to align to and, and, and keep trying to, you know, incrementally move things um, in that direction. Um, much, much easier said than done, but appreciate the appreciate the framework. Um, any other comments or questions for Jeremy or Pat? And I want to acknowledge that Ebony did join us today, and I know she's been here for a while. So welcome, Ebony. Thank you for, for being here today. All right. Well, it sounds like this is uh, there's a lot of interest and excitement around this topic, and it's Sounds like there was a request to make sure that we have a follow up conversation on this uh, during our retreat. So we'll definitely flag that and uh, add it to our retreat agenda. All right. Uh, well, thank you again so much for the presentation and exciting work to come. Uh, next, we have an update from Sarah Bartleman, who is the cost, cost growth target program manager, and Jeremy on just uh, some exciting updates on cost growth target. Jeremy? Let's get over to you, Sarah. That's all right. I think everybody's heard enough from me this morning. Yes, thanks. So just a couple of quick updates for everyone this morning. I know that last year we had planned to come back to you at the January meeting to talk about the cost growth target specifically um, for sort of final um, review and launching of the first public hearing and to appoint the new Cost Growth Target Advisory Committee membership. So our original agenda was to bring you the proposed slate and the final agenda for the hearing. Um, I'm here to say that we are going to postpone both of those things. So just a couple of quick updates on the timing and where we're at on those. Uh, next slide, please. So we are now planning to bring the proposed membership for the new advisory committee back to you at your March meeting, and we will hold off on convening the new advisory committee until March or April. We've reached out to all of the applicants and let them know that we're um, pausing this for a few more months, again, to make a little bit more space, especially given um, all of the health system partners that are involved in the advisory committee or that have applied for the advisory committee. So we will come back to you um, with this hopefully in March. And um, at this point, we don't have any major deadlines that the advisory committee or any and major deliverables that the advisory committee needs to tackle that we think will be affected by um, holding off on convening them for a few more months. So uh, more to come on this. And next slide. For the initial cost growth target public hearing, we had originally scheduled it for J January 24th, Monday. And we had been begun reaching out to speakers. We had been working with our planning group. Um, several board members were participating in that. And right before we uh, sent out the sort of save the date and mass broadcasting of this, we decided to postpone. Again, given Omicron and everything that's happening and the health system involvement, we thought it would be better to hold off on this. So we are going to push the initial cost growth target public hearing to late March or early April. Um, we do not have a new date yet. Hopefully we will. Um, come up with that in the next couple of weeks. Um, that said, we did have a good meeting with the planning group in December to finalize the agenda and really land on our proposed speakers. So there's a copy of the agenda outline that was provided in your meeting packet for today. So if folks want to take a look at that, you're welcome to um, let us know if you have any questions or comments. Um, and then we do have a request for the board today we were hoping that three board members would be willing to volunteer to serve as panel moderators for the public hearing. We have three um, panel sessions that are proposed on the agenda, and we are hoping that a board member would be willing to um, intro each of those panels and then provide a little of the facilitation or moderation um, Q&A for those topics. For those board members who volunteer, we'll work with you offline um, 
to prep and make sure you have some specific content. But if anyone wants to volunteer right now, that would be fantastic. If not, um, you still have two months. Um, we'll come back and follow up with you if um, if nobody volunteers. But um, let us know if you'd be interested in participating um, as a moderator. And Bill and Kirsten, as members of the planning group, is there anything that you'd like to add to this update? Sarah, thanks very much for this update, and thanks for your great work as as, as um, helping to put together this cost growth um, work group uh, and this whole initiative. Um, um, I think I've already volunteered, but if not formally, I, I, I will formally now volunteer to be a moderator, and uh, um, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that uh, <clears throat> that first uh, session. Uh, question is, what could you just comment on? how things are going with recruitment for the advisory committee in terms of getting the, the breadth of um, experience and knowledge, and expertise and representation from different sectors for the advisory committee. Uh, and uh, implicit in that question is, is there anything the board can do to help if needed uh, with recruitment for people on the advisory committee? Great, thanks. I should have said, um that we are going to leave the recruitment open on a rolling basis through January and February. So I think if board members have um, folks that they think would be a good fit for this advisory committee, um, you are welcome and encouraged to please reach out and have people um, submit an application. We have received a few more applications um, that have come in over the last couple of weeks. So um, thanks to board members who have helped with recruitment. We have some additional representatives from employers, large and small, that have applied. Um, we also have some additional consumer advocates, um, consumer representatives that have applied, um, including uh, insurance brokers, which is another great perspective to have on the committee. So I'm feeling pretty good about where we're, where we're going with the proposed slate, but certainly applications are still open and board members, um, please help if you know anyone who, who might be a good fit or interested. Brenda? Um, Brenda? Thanks. Just a follow up on a line, along the lines of recruitment and the diversity of the committee itself. I'm making an assumption that the same protocol that we've been placing for all of our other committees applies to this one as well. Uh, yes, um, I, I am not sure protocol like where the formal line is going to be. I think when we presented to you and. December, November, sorry, it all blurs together. Um, we shared that our applicant pool was not particularly diverse demographically, and there were some specific places that we were looking to improve there. I think that's that's an ongoing challenge. Um, and I think that'll be a question that we'll come back to the board with where we say, here's where, here's where we are. We think we have the right mix of sectors and expertise, but maybe not necessarily um, the demographic representation or geographic representation, and we'll ask the board to to weigh that when you consider the proposed slate in March. Dr. Sanda? Yeah, Sarah, thanks for uh, this work. Um, in the material somewhere, I recall there was mention of an estimate that costs had gone up 9%, um, but there was a huge segment of that that was COVID related and the non-COVID related costs were 1.6 or something of that sort. And I just think that's a really interesting number um, and would, would love you know, more information about it. And um, as, as we move along to, to try and understand um, what has happened with COVID and non-COVID costs and who's covered the COVID costs. So have the COVID costs is that the federal government coming in and saying, we'll take, you know, they obviously took care of vaccines, okay? Um, they've taken care of, I think, some of the other uh, uh, drugs and, and, and things. So um, I, I just was impressed with that um, uh, uh, information and, and would, would love to, to know more as, as things go along. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, can we skip ahead two slides, John? Our next. This is the reference um, that John is talking about. So one of our data sources that we look at really closely, um, this is a national data set. It is not our cost growth target measurement. So this is related, but not identical. Um, I just wanna be really clear up front that the things that are included in these estimates um, are 
it's a different basket of services. It's a different um, roll up of what we look at relative to the Costco target, but it provides really important context. And it's sort of the first look at what's happening um, at, at the macro level with healthcare expenditures. So every year, um, CMS publishes the national healthcare expenditure data um, that looks federally, it looks by market, um, and it provides some really high level trends. It's where um, a lot of the data that we've brought you in previous years has come from. Um, and on December 15th, the 2020 data was released. Um, and John, as you mentioned, spending, uh, national healthcare expenditure spending went up 9.7%. Um, the, the report that came out, the data, um, it's really clear that that is federal spending for COVID and public health programs. So as you mentioned, it's the vaccines, it's the um, money that went to providers, the PPP loans, um, all of that is included in that spending growth. Um, if you take all of that out, um, spending only grew 1.9%, sort of in a more apples to apples comparison with previous years and the, the authors believe that that is due to the reduced healthcare utilization that we've all seen from a number of data sources um, in 2020. I just want to build a finer point on this. So, um, you know, obviously there's lots of different ways to measure healthcare spending. This was, you know, the, <laughs> this was most, a lot of the work for the 18 months with the cost growth target committee was sort of at what point are we measuring and what's in and what's out. Um, for our, and, and so this is, a, this is basically a different measurement. This is really trying to get at sort of all of the spending, including whether it's coming from an insurer or it's coming from Congress. Um, and so this includes those um, big investments that came last year um, that don't normally happen of a direct payment from, from the federal government out to providers. Um, for our statewide cost growth target, we're measuring at a different level. We're measuring at the insurer and consumer to provider level. Um, and, and so just um, there's, the, you know, the, they have different purposes and different uses and just, uh, you know, reminder that it's not that we're measuring one, one's right or one's wrong. They're just trying to capture different things. And we thought that some of you might have seen this data. Um, it certainly made headlines. And so we wanted to just um, provide a little space today to, to share the, to share the report and to talk about it as it relates to our program, specifically to our program and how we are measuring um, cost growth and uh, expenditures. We included 2020 data in our initial data submission from insurers. We asked them to submit 18, 19, and 20 data. Um, we are hopefully going to be finalizing the initial validation of that this month, and we'll have some initial looks at that in um, uh, later, uh, February, March, April, hopefully. And um, we'll be able to come back to you and say, see, say a little more specifically about what 2020 and the impact of COVID looks like in Oregon with our cost growth target methodology. Any other questions or comments about any of these updates? Um, I think, Ebony, you had your hand up a few minutes ago. Um, did you have? Oh, I was just going to say that I'd be willing to um, facilitate depending on the timing. So happy to get more information offline. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Any other questions or comments for Sarah or Jeremy? All right. Well, Thank you. Looks we can we can also probably volunteer David to be that third moderator since he's not here today. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sarah, for all your great work. We're going to move right into public comments now. Uh, the Oregon Health Policy Board welcomes and deeply appreciates public testimony. Uh, it is one of the most powerful ways we demonstrate our commitment uh, to profound listening and learning. Deep listening means that we will not respond to what you share, nor will we attempt to fix or resolve the question or concern that you bring today. <clears throat> we will also not interject to correct inaccurate comments that are shared as facts. Uh, we will, however, bring it fully into our awareness, understand it as an important consideration of our work, and listen with the kind of careful attention, uh, respect, and honor that you deserve. Uh, we acknowledge that public comments <clears throat> are meant to provide a voice and a perspective from an individual and is not a representation of the Oregon Health Policy Board, its members, or the Oregon Health Authority. Each presenter is given two minutes to share, and in the event that doesn't feel like enough time, we encourage speakers to provide written testimony, uh, which we commit to reading. Uh, to help keep us on time, we'll start a slide with a two-minute timer for each presenter. 
Uh, we kindly ask that presenters conclude their presentation when the timer is complete. Uh, please know that written and verbal public comments will be reviewed and discussed following each meeting by the board chairs and staff to, de to determine the appropriate next steps. Uh, board staff will communicate the next steps with each public presenter. Uh, today, we actually have two public comment sessions. The first session, which is occurring now, for all comments that are not related to OHA's 1115 renewal waiver. Uh, comments related to the waiver will be heard later in today's meeting. Um, our first request for public comment is Danny Ella. Uh, welcome, Danny. Are you here? Uh, so my name is Daniela, um, and I have a comment for you today. Um, the COVID-19 global vaccine rollout is the largest drug deal of history, the largest and most responsible medical experiment in a crime against humanity. Patrick Allen, Rachel Banks, Kate Brown, OHA staff, you work for us. We the people pay your salaries, and you answer to us. We don't answer to you. Why are you continuing to use PCR tests that CDC recommended switching to tests that can differentiate between SARS-CoV-2 and influenza? How many COVID-19 cases were actually influenza? You all cry about your healthcare staff being overwhelmed. How many healthcare employees did Oregon lose to the unconstitutional vaccine mandates? Why are you not being more transparent about the fact that the five COVID reported deaths in Oregon in people zero to 19 years old all have persisting conditions. I looked it up, I spent hours on it. Why are you considering violating our 14th amendment by wanting to enforce indoor masking permanently? Do you know that Oregon is one of the very few silly states still making us wear masks? Can we officially call Omicron the variant of the vaccinated? Did you hear that cruise ships will stop operating because outbreaks took place among fully vaccinated staff and crew? Do you understand that the push for these vaccines is a crime against humanity? Do you understand that you will be some of the people held accountable when those trials begin? Why are you not fostering healthy habits instead of vaccine dependency? How about you teach people to stop drinking soda and eating McDonald's to have better health and be stronger to face any health challenge? OHA, Governor Brown, you are drug pushers. If religious and, discrimination and sexual discrimination is bad, why are you okay with unvaccinated people being segregated and discriminated in society with the use of this upcoming digital vax records? We the thinking people will hold you all accountable and we will fight back because the law is on our side and because it is our duty. How many more shots will you take until you figure this out? Wake up people, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, next we have Karen Christensen, uh, please state your name and affiliation for the record, and we'll set the two-minute timer and may begin when you're ready, Karen. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I live in Corvallis, Oregon, and I'm a member of HCAO and the Legislative Committee. Um, the re reform roadmap uh, is of some concern uh, to our organization. First, I'd like to acknowledge that it's wonderful to see this, uh, all these strings pulled together. But as John Santa said, it's very concerning that there was no recognition of the work of the Senate Bill 770 task force. And that must be included in the consideration by the Oregon Health Policy Board. Um, the legislative charge to the task force was to prepare a report with regard to a universal single payer system. And significant sums of money have been spent by the state of Oregon, uh, not only on the task force, but also on the RAND report, which was issued in uh, 2017 and should be reviewed by the task force as you evaluate the public option um, as a mechanism for uh, creating better health equity and reducing costs for the people of Oregon. Uh, this board should not take policy positions that diminish or uh, undercut in any way the work of the team. Karen, you went on mute. Okay. Um, the task force is now undertaking uh, public comments and will be making a report to the legislature uh, at, in September of 2022 and with the legislative consideration in 2023. We're also concerned about the timing of the uh, 
public option proposals that are apparently being put forth by the, uh, the staff. The resources, as Director Allen has indicated, are very um, limited and staff should be allowed the uh, focus on studying the um, reforms that they have been talking about and which are supported by the work of the task force. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next, we have Shireen Underwood. Um, Shireen, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Is Shireen here? All right, let's, uh, we'll come back to Shireen. Uh, let's, uh, next is Harry Singer. Uh, Harry, if you're here, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Okay, we'll come back as well. Uh, is Richard Gibson here? Sorry, this, this is oh. Harry Sanger. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Harry. Okay, um, sorry, I, I, I am here. Um, <laughs> I, my name is Harry Sanger. I'm, I'm here on behalf of myself as an individual and not representative of any group, um, just, just Oregonians in general. And uh, I, I have concerns that supporting oppression and segregation based on medical status is a form of radical extremism. Yet here we are talking about the OHA tool that will do just that. Uh, the parroted claim that this is voluntary and optional should be appended for now. Everyone who is still slowing the spread after two weeks plus two years knows that when the administrative state wants to exert authority under a proclaimed emergency, there is little that can be done to rein it back in. The public is here today to ask you to voluntarily rein it in. A failure to do so will continue to diminish the public trust in your authority. Uh, lawsuits are already being filed in federal court against the rampant segregation taking place under mask mandates. Many of us expect to be shut out of society if we don't want to carry vaccine papers. This is a violation of our basic human rights that will not be tolerated. Every legal avenue for redress will be explored. And the more this tyranny becomes evident, the more resistance it will be faced. So um, I, I know you've got a lot going on. We appreciate your work. Uh, I think we all just need to slow down and stop pushing uh, new changes to public health when, when it seems like we don't even have a grasp on it at the moment. And, uh, and, and to stop dictating how Oregonians live in the name of public health. Uh, this is how past atrocities have been carried out and uh, we wanna prevent any of those going forward. So thank you for your time today and for allowing me the opportunity to speak and happy new year. Thank you, Harry. Um, next, we have Richard Gibson. Richard, if you're here, please state your name and uh, any affiliation for the record. Um, we'll come back to Richard. Uh, is Tom, Tom Sinsik is, is next? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, this is Tom Sinsik. I'm with Healthcare for All Oregon and uh, love the uh, slideshow, uh, Jeremy and uh, Director Allen. Uh, it was really good. It really showed where we need to go in Oregon. And uh, what we do know is the marketplace is not where we want to go. It was a proposed mechanism to get to those other values that you so eloquently spoke to, all the things about cost, equity, you know, quality. And what we all the data seem to put us forward to say that it is really only a universal single payer system that will really get, get us there. That's why the legislature has convened this task force and of all these volunteers that are putting in tons of volunteer hours, of which the OHA is staffing. And so again, wondering, um, saying, well, why it wasn't included? Is there a bias here in the OHA around this issue? Why one legislation was concluded in this report and another piece wasn't. Uh, in addition, I'd like to say, quote something, I, insurance is what gives you access. Well, isn't that just a problem? Why is it that insurance gives us access? Why don't we just have access, right? Why do we have to sign up I'm in, the, um, it took me 14 visits to get me access to a provider that was listed in my uh, 14 calls to get me listed to a provider that I supposedly had access to. 
Um, we know that insurance is also a basis for preventing access over and over and again. That's why people delay care, as was pointed out, because of cost and uh, denials, those kinds of things. It's a burden on providers, as well as the system, as well as the state. Um, our public dollars are paying for that burden with the administrative waste that's in that systems. Uh, you mentioned something very important, which is a community voice. You know we have a robust plan for a community voice. This should be integrated with your plan for a community voice in uh, the discussions going forward according to your plan. I thank you for all the work of this uh, group and look forward to uh, following up, particularly around the waivers that are going to be so important to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm going to come back to Shireen Underwood. Is Shireen here? All right, and then um, Richard Gibson, coming back to Richard Gibson. All right, well, uh, I believe uh, that concludes our uh, public testimony not related to the 1115 waiver. Uh, we are now going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back uh, to get a presentation on the Medicaid waiver. So we'll come back at uh, 10 uh, 25.
All right, we'll get started in a minute. All right, we will uh, get the meeting going again. And next up, we have uh, Lori Coiner, OHA Senior uh, Medicaid Policy Advisor with the 1115 Waiver Renewal Team uh, to share a little bit about what's been happening with public comment since we kicked it off at our last meeting in December. Uh, Lori, uh, Happy New Year. Welcome and go ahead and take it away. Happy New Year, everyone. And I think we have some slides. Hopefully we can get those up. Uh, I'm here, yeah, to give a summary of the uh, public input that we've, and the fact that we've received so far since um, we submitted or posted the draft application for our waiver on um, December 1st. Uh, I do wanna let everyone know that our public comment period um, continues until January 7th. So if you, want to make um, formal public comment there. I'll talk about at the end how to do that, but there's still time. Um, so next slide. Hey, Lori, um, Annette lost sound. So we're going to have to switch. So if you want to ad lib, we'll get the I'll, I'll start sharing the slide. Okay, great. Uh, first, just a reminder of the timeline. Here is um, where we are. Uh, as all of you know, we've been working on the waiver now for a year, um, and we are in November. Um, you'll see the final concept papers were released the 1st of November with our draft application um, posted for public comment, official public comment, though we did receive comments on the concept papers during November. Um, the draft application was posted December 1st and our formal public comment period um, ran December 7th um, and through January 7th. So like I said, still a few more days. We'll be taking um, January to incorporate the feedback that we received into our waiver and submit the application to CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in February. Um, at that time, negotiations with CMS will begin uh, up through this, likely through the summer. Um, I do want to point out, because it's not on this timeline, that our tribal consultation also, um, we started that in the, around the 1st of December, and that's ongoing. So um, we, we met with tribes across the summer um, in numerous meetings, and then our formal consultation, um, we had a formal consultation um, within the first couple of weeks of December. Next slide. We've provided uh, quite a number of options to provide public comment. Um, we hosted seven different public forums. There were four meetings in December. Um, one of them, I guess, uh, well, four meetings, December Oregon Health Policy Board today. And then we also presented to the Oregon Health Policy Board Health Equity Committee and uh, the Medicaid Advisory Committee. And then we had three separate webinars. Um, uh, the community partners, that there are folks that work with um, organizations throughout our state that help mem um, potential members become OHP members and then also help them navigate the system. We uh, had one of those in exclusively in Spanish. Um, there were about 15 participants there uh, and then an English um, version and then also the Waiver Days workshop, which occurred in the evening. So people who um, have other jobs could attend. There's also an opportunity to provide written comment. Uh, we have an email 
um, mailbox or inbox. And um, we have been putting out surveys around our meet our webinars. And, um, and then we have a wedge web page that leads to that survey form and we'll, I'll provide the links at the end of this. Next slide. So just to give an overview of who has um, listened to our webinars and presentations and then the comments that we've received. I will, I do want to mention that we've had really great attendance, um, not much formal uh, comment and, you know, and to date. Now, I, I'm sure there will be uh, more uh, comments that come in across this week, but we've had, we had 343 folks um, attend our various uh, presentations and webinars with 26 um, formal comments. Um, a couple of those were, were the same comments, but submitted through a different ways. Um, and then we've had, it's been about equally split in terms of the type of comment, whether it's been verbal, we do have, you know, comment period time available for people who want to uh, just state their, their comments verbally, um, emails and letters, and then uh, nine comments submitted through a, through a survey opportunity. Next slide. This shows who's commented so far. Um, had lots of medical providers other than CCOs. Um, also, I, our next highest is, you know, we've had comments from consumer advocates and community organizations, and then follow, followed by CCO representatives. So um, take a look, it's, it's, we have a distribution across various, you know, areas, and, and I think that's, that's hopeful. I'm also happy to see that our com consumer advocates and community organizations um, show up. Um, big, though I will say that's only five comments or six from medical providers. So we're, you know, we, we haven't received um, lots of comment. Now I read that as a really good sign on um, usually comments come where, you know, we're missing the mark or they want to see big changes in the waiver or minor changes in the waiver. Um, and I, and I think that um, we're not hearing as much mostly because we're on track. Um, so we've had lots of attendance at meetings, but not a lot of formal comments saying, hey, you know, um, you forgot, forgot a key area or things like that. Next slide. Uh, this is just a summary of what we've heard. Um, and like I mentioned, so 80% of our comments have asked for changes in our application. Um, and then a few, many, you know, 20% are comments that say, be sure to keep this, or you know, we, we think this piece in the application is really important. Um, I think this is a good summary of kind of what we're hearing. So um, there's comment around our community, um, the focus community investment. So really um, comments around wanting our community collaboratives and the relationships to our community um, advisory councils on the CCOs and how those are gonna work all together. Um, there have been some um, comments around supporting our continuity of coverage and, and you know, asking for uh, coverage while people are incarcerated and that there's um, you know, been positive feedback there. Um, some suggestions for improving our continuous access to substance use treatment. Um, and then concerns have come up around um, our pharmacy piece, our um, early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment, which is um, often called EPSDT, and that's a coverage for um, you know, kids. Um, and then lastly, alignment with House Bill 3353, which 3353 is um, kind of covered in our focused equity investment. So more around that. Here's options. Uh, as I said, I would provide for public comment. Um, public comment could be provided at today's meeting. Um, you can provide or upload public comment through a survey and there's a link right there under item two. Um, there's also another way if you go to our OHA's waiver renewal pay, web page where um, comment can be submitted and then um, 
a person can or organization can submit an email and the um, email address is listed there under four. So once we close our public comment period, um, here's what will happen with it. Um, we, we need to report all of our formal public comment as part of our waiver application to CMS. Um, that's a re federal requirement. Um, and then we will also report out to the public, um, you know, what comment we received. So uh, we're transparent about that. Um, the public comments will, will be reported both to um, CMS and and on our website, um, along with a uh, um, submitter's name and organization, and then how the comment was incorporated into our fi final application, and if it wasn't, why. And that's all I have for today. So I'm just going to pause and see if there are any questions or discussion. And it would be great if um, you can go back to the opportunities to uh, provide comment, just flash them up there for another minute in case anybody's watching and didn't catch it. Uh, Dr. Santa. Yeah, Lori, uh, thanks. Um, you know, I've, I've heard um, you and Jeremy present multiple times and listen to feedback and, and really, I, I think you all have done just a terrific um, job. And, um, you know, I think overall the waiver um, uh, is appropriately um, ambitious. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure as a member of OHPB, you know, what, uh, what we say are comments, et, et cetera, but just, just a couple of comments. You know, I'm trying to understand the CCO's worries about the community um, a collaborative. Um, and um, um, I'm struggling because, you know, I mean, I, I see that as um, OHA is trying to move the CCOs to being more of, to have more of a priority for um, uh, community input and um, equity. And gosh, I, I, I see that as a positive and as an opportunity for CCOs. And I'm, I'm not, you know, um, quite certain that I, I understand um, their concern, other than since they're risk bearing organizations, they're worried whenever money goes in a, in a direction that's um, uh, different than theirs. So, so that's just an area that puzzles me. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's one we um, uh, uh, can or should discuss, but I put it out there. Um, the second area is I see some of the comments related to children. And, um, um, you know, that has been a prior priority for OHPB. Uh, it was a high priority in CCO 2.0. Um, and while I, I don't think it's identified the same way now as it was in 2.0, um, certainly in, in 2021, children's issues have been um, a, a high priority. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it has made me think back uh, to 20 years ago when I was in state government and ESPDT was um, an issue then. And my recollection is the, the, the state wanted to waive any and all federal um, regulations that um, forced it to do something from a benefit point of view. Um, and, and that was the era we were in. Um, uh, I, but I wonder, um, you know, um, what is it today, 20 years later, that we would find objection, objectionable in um, uh, EPS uh, DT? Um, and has HERC um, looked at that and, um, and all? Um, uh, the final thing for me, again, in children, because as you know, I've been interested in retroactive eligibility, is... Um, uh, uh, the, the idea of extending retroactive eligibility um, uh, to women who are pregnant um, seems reasonable to me. And, um, you know, likely a minimal impact. Maybe I'm missing something here. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I just think that would be 
um, a boon to those providers who are mostly outpatient providers and mostly um, uh, likely folks who, you know, are, are taking care of very vulnerable populations and, and uh, providing a, a retroactive stream of, of income to them for uh, stepping up um, for that vulnerable population would be a positive and, and would be, um, uh, uh, would contribute to um, a positive movement in terms of equity. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure from an OHPB um, point of view, you know, um, what to do with those, but I just wanted to put them out there. Thank you. Uh, Lori, you want me to jump in? Sure. Okay, so I'll try to try to take these uh, in order, um, or at least the first couple. So um, there's been a lot of conversation with um, both CCOs, but also with um, uh, the regional health equity coalitions and uh, health equity committee of the board and others around um, the community investment collaborative. Um, so I mean, I may not capture all of the concerns um, one, on either side or, or support, um, but I would say broadly, um, the, there's, there's a couple of things. One, um, you know, the, the idea of the club is really came out of conversations that we've had with uh, with community, especially around the health equity definition around um, uh, uh, redistributing power and resources to community um, and to and have communities that have faced inequities really be um, at the at the decision making point of how to how to rectify uh, those inequities. Um, there's sort of two two different funding streams. Um, related to the collaborative. So one is um, House Bill 3353 that passed last session that requires um, us to seek approval for CCOs to spend 3% of their global budgets on a, a variety of, um, of, of uh, things um, related to equity and, and that 1% of that specifically go um, uh, to the community to, to invest in equity. Um, it's, it's a bill that passed, it requires us to get CCMS approval for it. Um, but but basically calls out that one percentage point, roughly of that three percentage point, go to the community to address equity. Separately, in the waiver, um, we've proposed um, seeking some additional federal dollars above and beyond what CCOs would now or in the future get paid for uh, for their as part of their global budget to cover services is above what CCOs would get paid. Uh, we've asked for those investments and that those investments specifically go to the community and that they be targeted specifically towards addressing um, health inequities. Um, so, um, and, and the reason for that really is, is because we have been saving the federal government um, a significant amount of money under the Oregon Health Plan, um, and we've got savings there, and we'd like to um, be able to um, get collect some of that savings basically or capture some of that savings um, and be able to give it to the communities that have faced inequities to be able to make um, targeted investments and things that will, that will improve health inequities. Um, I think there's been some miscommunication, I think there's been some misunderstanding on, I think, frankly, from some folks that, that the dollars we're asking for in the waiver are above and beyond what would CCOs would be paid. They're really, um, you know, sort of um, ex extra dollars, if you will. It, there's, there, it's also very, very um, tentative that we'd even be able to be able to get those dollars. Um, the program that allows states to get to get federal investments through waivers had, was turned off under the Trump administration. And several states are asking that that program be turned back on, um, but but they haven't spoken to it yet. We don't know whether there, there's gonna be a willingness to go there or not. Um, and, we, and so um, it remains sort of un, 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 unknown whether or not we actually be able to get those additional dollars. Um, um, so that those there's some confusion there. I think there's there's also two different funding streams. I think there's probably more concern around the one percentage point of CCO global budgets than there is about the um, the sort of bonus dollars in the waiver. Um, um, but I, I think there's a, a point of just um, I, I think there's some concerns from CCOs that we've heard around um, one you know a percentage of their budget that that would go to community that they wouldn't have direct control over where it would go. Um, I think there's some concerns around um, uh, whether that those collaborators would duplicate efforts of the community advisory council um, uh, um, or create sort of conflicting priorities. I think there's concerns that the dollars on the waiver, if those are one time and only stretched out for several years, that that maybe creates an expectation that once those dollars run out, those community partners that received those dollars would come back to the CCO and CCOs, you know, I think um, legitimately have felt a lot of pressure from community to fund a whole bunch of different activities. 
Um, on the, the flip side of that is, um, you know, I think we've we have heard from community that the importance of that them really driving the investments. If dollars are tied to um, to uh, or targeted towards improving equity, that it's got to be the communities that have faced inequities that that really drive where those investments go. Um, and so we recognize that this does create some complexity. It does create, you know, a new uh, entity, organization, or collaborative um, that CCOs would need to work with. Um, and, but part of that is shifting uh, power and resources um, in decision making. Um, and so I think there's just there's a there's a tension point there um, that we're trying to work through, but uh, but may not be able to resolve uh, when we've got you know community community telling us we need to really be um, just you know making investments that are targeted towards equity, and you've got folks that don't want to be able to give up control or power of, of resources, understand, understandably in, in some ways. But there's a tension there that that I'm not sure we'll be able to resolve. Um, on the EPSDT, um, so we administer benefits differently in Oregon for the for Medicaid than any other state. We have a prioritized list. Um, you know, most states they just you fall back to basically medical necessity criteria, um, it's, which is a very ambiguous way to understand what can be covered and what can't be covered. Usually, you have to, you know, have a provider say you need a service and then if it gets denied by the, by the insurer or, or Medicaid managed care organization, you go through an appeals process and you try to argue that it's necessary. We've developed a very different process in Oregon where there's a, a public transparent way of looking at um, possible benefits, um, tying those to um, uh, to tie those to basically the, what evidence says is, is their effic efficacy. And then we have a, a list of where we've ranked services based off of um, how, how effective they are. Um, the, so part of being able to do that required a, a waiver, and that was really the initial element of what, why we got a waiver for the Oregon Health Plan to begin with. Um, the idea was to be able to give as many people a core set of high value services, rather than say, uh, we can only, we can only, we only have enough money to cover certain, everything for a certain amount of, amount of people. Um, the EPSDT waiver um, was, was one of the elements to be able to, um, to be able to do benefits through the prioritized list. Um, it's not that we don't cover services that are covered under EPSDT. It's really that we administer them differently. We administer it through the prioritized list. We cover those services that are above, above the funding line. Um, we've had a number of um, concerns raised by advocates of services that they feel like should be covered both under EPSDT and, and services that are above the funding line on the prioritized list. Um, we've been, it's actually been really helpful that we've been getting um, that feedback. We've been, we've been working through those concerns one by one. Um, in a lot of cases, they actually are covered services on the prioritized list. And so we've been going back and trying to clarify that and try to figure out if it's a clarity on the prioritized list issue or if it's a contract administration with CCOs um, issue. But um, the waiver doesn't, we don't utilize the waiver to not cover any services under our EPSDT. We really utilize it to be able to cover services through a ranking of, uh, through the prioritized list. Um, and so there's, I think, some confusion out there around what, what the EPSDT waiver is, but that's, that's in essence what it is. Lori, anything you'd add? No, I think you covered it well. And on the, the EPSDT services, like Jeremy said, we administer it differently. And so it's a little bit hard for people to understand, I think, um, relative to um, our prioritized list and such. So, uh, What about the retro for pregnancy? Retro eligibility for um, pregnancy? Yeah, you know, I... I'm not sure, John. I, you know, we did. We are without a waiver. Um, at, um, incorporating 12 months of postpartum for pregnancy. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer for you on the retro for pregnancy and and whether that's something we should be looking at. Um, it hasn't come up as a question before that I'm aware of, but um, we can take a look. Yeah, and I, I think it's a very interesting idea. And yep, you know, certainly seems compelling, um, as compelling as uh, retro when you're hospitalized and. You know. Right, and I don't know what the, what, I don't know off the top of my head is how, if there, we already incorporate some sort, you know, I don't know if a woman, if a woman comes in and applies for OHP, um, you know, what that looks like when they're pregnant. So I'll have to get back to you. Okay. 
Kristen. Great, thank you. My question may be a bit premature given that um, the comment period doesn't end until this week. And it's also late in that <laughs> I want to acknowledge that there are multiple forms, which is great, but they all require a computer or a piece of technology to access. Um, so I just was curious about how the number of comments and the number of uh, the 343 people, uh, the number of attendees compares to prior or, or prior public waiver, public comment periods, or other public comment periods that we think we could use as a barometer to assess, um, like was was this effective or did did we did, should we strive for? Is there something to learn here? I yeah, know that's a really good question. I will say I attended all of the both the both of the CPOP webinars and the um, the waiver open forum. And we did that, you know, we did receive verbal comments. So, so, and we did have OHP members and, and I know some gave verbal test, you know, comment. So there was a, that would be, um, but to your point, you need to have some sort of computer access for all of that. Um, and I, but what I don't have for you in terms of an answer is what it looked like in prior, um, you know, prior submission. So we'd have to to look more closely. And I don't know, Jeremy, if you have any thoughts on kind of what we've done more recently and other kinds of public comment. But yeah, I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but I would say um, a couple of things. One, I mean, this is just the comments during this formal comment period. Obviously we've been collecting input and having conversations throughout the last year. So that's numbers don't reflect that. Um, we, we've also known that we're on a, we're on a expedited path here and have sort of have said at the outset that it's not as robust. It's not, you know, as um, as sort of going out to the community with a with a blank slate of paper is what we're trying to do in a lot of other um, a lot of other forms, and, and a lot of that's just been driven by a timeline and a pandemic in the middle of it, and also the fact that we've gone through a bunch of other recent OH very large OHP engagement processes like CCO 2.0. So we've been trying to we're not just trying we did we we have pulled in those comments. Um, at the outset and are building off of it as opposed to sort of starting from scratch. So I think it becomes a little hard to kind of, you know, compare because we're, I, you know, to some degree kind of seeing this as an extension of the CCO 2.0 process to, um, that we went through. But um, I think, frankly, we were not expecting that the comment period at the end of this I don't think we were expecting hundreds or thousands of comments, not because we didn't want them, but because to some degree that would have seemed like a failure that we weren't engaging anybody up until that point. But uh, but I don't have any specific numbers off the top of my head to compare to. Jessica? Jessica, we can't hear you. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay, good. I saw that uh, California's waiver was approved, and I was wondering if there's any indication of, you know, how that, um, how Oregon may um, work out. Whether that you it, their their approval was an indication that we might get, that we may be able to leverage more federal dollars or have more flexibility in in how those dollars are spent. Is there do you have any idea of how how, how that result? I, um, really good question. So um, just to let everyone know, you're right, California's waiver was approved on um, December 31st. And um, just had a brief on it. There are their um, standard terms and conditions were just posted. But um, so it does give us some pretty good indication around um, what we can expect. I think we're still diving into what that means. I will say this, that the criminal, um, the cover, they also had a request uh, for covering folks who are uh, involved in criminal justice. Um, CMS um, it didn't approve, but they, um, but um, they um, are still working on it and they, they are supportive of it. Um, they just didn't have enough time to put their guidance together. Um, they've been working on some other guidance. What I heard this morning was there's a good chance by the time we submit that guidance will be there. So I think that um, I'm feeling pretty positive about it actually. It's because they didn't get a hard no. <laughs> um, it's a, we're, we're working on this. Um, they did approve some additional dollars um, 
we need to look at more around what that how that is it's for services it was pretty positive in that it services for uh, community organizations around um like building infrastructure and things like that um and then around there in lieu of services um there's it's kind of detailed but they but they did get some sorts of um kind of social determinant type services approved um and it, so i think that it's really a very, very good indication about where CMS is and what kinds of things that we can expect. So I'm feeling pretty good about it, but just heard this morning and we're gonna get a bigger brief from um, the consultants that worked with California. So more to come on that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Lori or Jeremy? Um, Lori, question about sort of um, a feedback loop back to folks who did provide public testimony. I know that, um, you know, part of the, the waiver application requires OHA to sort of uh, collect this data and, and talk about this data and, and how, is it was, how it was incorporated or not. I'm, I'm curious to know if folks who either provided public testimony will have an opportunity to hear back directly from OHA as well. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we will be incorporating it and posting it. Um, for meetings like this and the MAC, uh, the Medicaid Advisory Committee and all, um, we'll likely come back and just provide that information. Um, we, I will have to talk to the team, but but I, I think there is real good value uh, to your point in getting back with our community partners and kind of our waiver, um, waiver days, you know, webinars to say, here's, here's what we heard, here's what we incorporated, here's what we didn't. So um, uh, happy to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we are moving on now to the next uh, second version of public testimony, which will be uh, specifically focused on the 1115 waiver. Um, again, uh, the Oregon Health Policy Board welcomes and deeply appreciates public testimony. It is one of the most powerful ways we demonstrate our commitment uh, to profound listening and learning. Uh, deep listening means that we will not respond to what you share, nor will we attempt to fix or resolve the question or concern that you bring today. We will also not interject to correct inaccurate comments that are shared as fact. Um, we will, however, bring it into our awareness, understand it as an important consideration of our work, and listen with the kind of careful attention, respect, and honor that you deserve. Uh, we acknowledge that public comments are meant to provide a voice and a perspective from an individual, and is not a representation of the Oregon Health Policy Board, its members, or the Oregon Health Authority. Each presenter will be given two minutes to speak in the event that doesn't feel like enough time, we encourage you to provide written testimony, which we commit to reading. Uh, to help us keep on time, we'll start a slide with a two minute timer uh, for each presenter. Uh, we kindly ask that presenters conclude their presentation when the timer is complete. Uh, please know that written and verbal public comments will be reviewed and discussed following each meeting by the board chairs and staff to determine appropriate next steps. Uh, board staff will communicate the next step with each presenter. Um, our first request for 1115 uh, waiver public comment is from Annie Valtiera Sanchez. Welcome, Annie. Uh, if you're here, can you please state your name and affiliation for the record? And then we'll set the two minute timer. Um, yes, thank you. My name is Annie Valtiera Sanchez. I am the director of a uh, regional health equity coalition in Southern Oregon, so healthy. And I am here um, on behalf of the other ranks. Uh, so dear Chair Banksberg and members of the Oregon Health Policy Board, um, I'm here to clarify the stance of regional health equity coalitions with regards to the concepts in the 1115 Medicaid waiver application. Um, specifically, this group wants to be clear that we strongly support and are advocating for the community investment collaboratives model. Um, we, the RECs, participated in co-writing House Bill 3353 and to help carry forward the vision and goals in the bill, 
We also participated in a waiver work group related to focus equity investments concept. We also develop a set of principles to guide that process. And previously we, um, as we stated to the Oregon Health Policy Board here back in August, it is our hope that all waiver concepts will be aligned with the principles, uh, which also reflect the asks in House Bill 3353, which prioritize target investments and efforts to populations and communities who have been most impacted by historic and contemporary injustices and health inequities, shift power and decision-making authority to community voice, create opportunity, opportunities to build sustainable infrastructure systems and programs that recognize, reconcile, and rectify historical and contemporary injustices, support community leadership development, build and rebuild trust between health systems and community. Um, we know that it cannot be done in silos, so we are calling to action um, OHA, our allies and partners, our CCO partners, to join us in advocating for this necessary and fundamental shift. Um, we especially ask that they trust the wisdom of communities that they are meant to serve and join us in this effort. We are also calling to action OHPV members. Um, if parity and delivery of services and health equity are a priority for you all, please help support this effort to shift power and resources to communities through your positions of leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, next is Kevin Copps. Kevin, are you here? Uh, we'll come back to Kevin. Uh, next on the list is Christian Moeller Anderson. Christian, if you're here, please state your name and affiliation. Hello, my name is Christian Moeller Anderson, and I serve as the executive director for A Smile for Kids. Thank you for the opportunity to share some feedback about the 1115 waiver renewal application and a special thanks to Dr. Santa for your earlier questions about EPSDT. Uh, a Smile for Kids is an Oregon-based private 501c3 nonprofit organization that funds orthodontic treatment for our Medicaid youth in all of Oregon's 36 counties. We have existed since 2004 because Oregon excludes OHP kids from any orthodontic treatment unless there's a cleft palate or craniofacial syndrome involved. We are disappointed that OHA has requested that CMS renew the state's authority to restrict coverage for treatment services identified during EPSDT screenings to those services that are consistent with the prioritized list of health services for individuals above age one. We think this waiver is unnecessary for OHA to achieve its programmatic goals, and we're especially concerned about its impact on children with handicapping malocclusions. In all other states, the Medicaid program covers medically necessary orthodontic services for children who have this severe and life-altering condition. Mm -hmm. Handicapping malocclusion can interfere with eating, speaking, sleeping, smiling, and normal social relating. It can affect both the physical and the social emotional development of children. Its impact can be felt over a lifetime in the loss of achievements in education, possibilities in employment, and a reduction in overall health and wellness, including mental health. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, of Oregon's most vulnerable children are currently denied access to critical and medically necessary care, care that should be covered as part of the EPSDT benefit. A Smile for Kids does its best to fill this gap, but we have resources to serve only about 60 new applicants each year and usually have around 200 active kids during non-COVID times in braces. We have filed more detailed written comments, but the bottom line is that we urge OHA to reconsider its request to waive these EPSDT requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Um, next, we have Josh Ballack. Josh, if you're here, please state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, my name is Josh Ballack. I'm the uh, Vice President of Government Affairs for All Care Health. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, All Care Health is very supportive of many of the parts of the waiver, including the increase of overall enrollment in CCOs, keeping health care continuity for members as they transition from different care settings, and an attempt to create flexibility and invest upstream, and creating metrics to ensure those investments happen. But there are still concerns around the draft waiver when it cre uh, to create new healthcare silos that does not properly align with the bipartisan supported bill of HB 3353. 
Regions across Oregon are extremely complex and often priority populations have different needs in the same region. An example would be Spanish speaking community in Jackson County is very different and has very different barriers than the Spanish speaking community even in Brookings, which is only 60 miles away. The new silos uh, that are proposed in the new waiver are said to be empowering community, but there's no definition of what the community is. Regions are not defined, membership is not defined. Because of this lack of clarity, there is going to be gaps where communities are missed and creating uh, silos and health equity separated from the whole system will make these, uh, these gaps even more pronounced. Equally concerning is how these new groups will actually submit uh, to the OHA for grant dollars. These new, these two major, there are two major concerns for this. One, this significantly weakens local control, and two, HB 33 was, uh, was designed to hold both CCOs and the OHA accountable. How can these new entities hold the OHA accountable if they are beholden to the OHA for grants? Finally, this new silo of handing out grants sets back uh, five years what CCOs and the, and the CCOs Community Advisory Councils have been doing. Because CCOs have never had a true global budget, our councils have been stuck giving out grants as opposed to giving multi-year community, uh, multi-year funding for community projects. All Care Community Advisory Councils highlighted many of these multi-year projects they would have loved to have funded, but be, uh, but have were not able to do, um, and um, and they would think that 3353 would make it more sustainable. Um, I know that I've run out of time, but I do want to make sure that uh, as we're moving forward, that uh, that there's more effort to actually close the gap and that as you are incorporating these comments into the process that the Oregon Health Authority does a much better job of actually bringing in people to actually say are we are we actually getting what we're trying to do as you're making changes to the actual final waiver that you end up proposing. I would also strongly encourage including community advisory councils, especially considering a large uh, part of their membership is made up of actual Oregon Health Plan users. Thank you. For the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next, we have Megan Moyer. Megan, if you're here, please state your name and who you from. Hello, my name is Megan Moyer. I'm the Public Policy Director for Disability Rights of Oregon. And um, I would like to say that Disability Rights Oregon finds many of the new ambitious ideas in this waiver to be exciting and we are very supportive, but we continue to have very serious concerns about how OHA uses quality or quality adjusted life years in how it has prioritized its list as well as we do not support the continued uh, waiver of EPSDT. I have had many conversations with OHA related to quality and um, frankly feel like I'm not getting a clear answer about how it's used today. Uh, but it is very clear that the quality score was at the heart of much of the scoring that was done at least up until 2013, possibly to 2017. I was, it was also clarified that quality was not, um, we did not rescore all the scores made that were uh, done before 2013, which was the overwhelming majority of conditions and treatments were scored using a quality adjusted life year model and is still ranked with that score today. Quality adjusted life years is a deeply discriminatory measurement that devalues the life of people with disabilities. It treats people who have chronic disease and disability as if their life is worth a fraction of what the life of a healthy person is. It is not based on science. It does not have any value um, outside of the opinions of healthcare professionals of what they believe the quality of life is for somebody with a disability. The health professions are well documented as being discriminatory and biased against people with disabilities. And yet it is still a score that has been incorporated and at the heart of our prioritized list. DRO is asking that we disavow the quality adjusted life year and rescore using a non-biased matrix 
the prioritized list so that people with disabilities are not disproportionately impacted at, by the prioritized list. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Colleen Ruland. Um, Colleen, if you're here and ready to go, please state your name and affiliation. I'm on, but I can't turn on my video. Does that matter? That's okay. It says the host stopped it. Um, we can hear you. There we go. Now it started. Okay. Hi, I'm Colleen Ruland, the director of the Oregon Pediatric Improvement Partnership. We are extremely supportive of the elements of the waiver focused on addressing structural racism in children. Within OHA's health equity definition, a key component for children in Medicaid and CHIP is the intentional inclusion of disability. For children with special health care needs, the Oregon Health Plan is the safety net for their medical, behavioral, oral, and care coordination needs. In Oregon, 145,000 publicly insured children, so that's more than one in four, have medical complexity. We hear from parents and young adults consistently and persistently about how their access to and care coordination needs continue to be unmet. We have significant concerns about the waiver proposal related to incentivizing equitable care. Measures that are incentivized have been shown to be a critical tool to focus on specific populations for which improvements are desperately needed. The current proposal will result in no metrics that will incentivize equitable quality care for children with special health care needs and the very program meant to ensure these children's needs are met. The upstream metrics proposed, although critical in addressing some of the historical inequity and social challenges faced, do not contain metrics focused on children with disabilities. The etiology of disabilities with children is different than adults and that a majority are not caused by lifestyle or life circumstances that could be addressed by upstream efforts. The current proposal calls for downstream metrics to only be chosen from the CMS core set. In the set, there are no metrics for children and youth with special health care needs. There are no metrics for focus on care coordination and complex health management. And the metrics included focus on behavioral health do not measure integrated behavioral health or dyadic behavioral health. The metrics program must be designed in a way that ensures equitable access to high quality care for children youth with special health care needs. And therefore we strongly recommend reconsideration of the waiver language related to downstream metrics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Colleen. Um, next, I wanna go back to uh, Richard Gibson. Richard, are you here? Good morning, I'm Richard Gibson, physician Informaticist at Comagine Health. We appreciate the opportunity to support the renewal of Oregon's Medicaid waiver to improve health equity. Comagine Health is a national nonprofit healthcare consulting organization. We've been working collaboratively with patients, providers, payers, and community based organizations for 40 years in Oregon to provide care management and quality improvement services, as well as cost and quality data management. Comagine Health supports continuous enrollment of adults and children in the Oregon Health Plan. We partner with OHA to monitor health outcomes for Medicaid beneficiaries. We have maintained an all-payer claims database since 2010 in Oregon that allows us to track cost, quality, and utilization indicators in the commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid markets. Our all-payer claims database can follow individuals over the years, even if they change insurance companies or markets. Enrollment data show that individuals are moving from OHP to self-pay and back. Such churn increases health risk to individuals and the loss of claims diminishes the completeness of quality and cost data. Comagine Health supports expanding funding of community-based organizations and traditional health workers to address health inequity. Community-based organizations frequently rely on grant funding to deliver services, a model insufficient to support sustainable infrastructure needed to scale. Comagine Health assists these organizations to engage with the emerging Community Health Information Exchange in Oregon. We help them build infrastructure and standardized workflow for referral to evidence-based self-management programs they provide and to receive payment from Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you for the opportunity to support Oregon Health Authority and its Medicaid waiver application. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, are there any other uh, public comments related to the 1115 waiver at this point? All right. 
Um, that brings us to the end of our January meeting. Um, thank you all so much for your time and attention and your dedication to health and health equity. Uh, we will see you all again on Tuesday, February 1st for our regular uh, board meeting. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.